Is adultery a capital offense? The rational part of my brain knows it's not. However, if I'd had my pistol in hand when I saw my wife and her lover enter the hotel room, things might have gone differently. Thankfully, by the time I reached my truck, I had calmed down and only briefly glanced at the center console where I kept it. I often carry large sums of cash for work and have a 357 in the truck for emergencies. I've only ever used it at the gun range, but I enjoy owning it. I called my boss and explained that I needed to take the rest of the day off and possibly tomorrow. I had to find a lawyer and make a plan. I withdrew $3,000 from our account and opened a new one in my name only, leaving $5,000 behind to cover this month's rent and bills. We had only one credit card for emergencies, which I canceled. Our lease was month to month, so there was no house to worry about, and there were no children involved. I wasn't going to forgive her, especially since this was at least the fourth time I had discovered she used the credit card for hotel stays. I looked up the account online, saw the charges, and found that she had been transferring money from her bank account to cover them. Since there was no balance owed on the card at the end of the billing cycle, we wouldn't receive a paper statement, and the email notifications went to her. If I hadn't checked, I would never have known. It's strange. If my debit card hadn't malfunctioned yesterday, I wouldn't have checked our balance. And if I hadn't checked, I wouldn't have noticed the credit card payments. If I hadn't seen the payments, I wouldn't have discovered the charges. And if I hadn't discovered the charges, I wouldn't have gone to the hotel. If I hadn't gone to the hotel, I wouldn't be facing the reality of divorcing my unfaithful wife. I should have confronted her last night, but I was still trying to process the betrayal. Now that I had proof, it was time to act. I found a lawyer online specializing in divorces and shared my story. Given we had only been married for four years, I could likely negotiate minimal spousal support. She had been working at a good job for six months, which is why we had switched to a month-to-month -month lease as we had planned to buy a house. Now, who knows what she was thinking. After sorting everything out, I went home and grabbed a beer. It hit me. Despite everything, I still loved her. I wondered why she did this and what I did wrong. I knew if I wallowed in self-pity, I'd get nowhere. So, I began marking things around the house with tape, my game systems, the TV, and the exercise equipment. Everything else was tied to memories we shared, and it was too painful to keep. As I wandered, I came up with elaborate revenge fantasies, trapping her and her lover in a snowbound cabin, or worse. I realized these thoughts were extreme and not practical. It was better to focus on divorcing her and moving on. I was sad because I had envisioned a future with her, growing old together, having children. Every memory came rushing back. Our first date at the theater, a weekend at Myrtle Beach, sitting with her while her dad was ill, and our wedding night. I recalled the closeness we shared, but now those memories were tainted by the image of her with someone else. My reverie was interrupted when she came home. Julian, what are you doing here? She asked, running towards me. I put the sofa between us and just stared. There was nothing immediately obvious that she had been with someone else today, but that wasn't surprising. I know you've been seeing someone from work, I said trying to keep my voice steady. I suggest you start going through and tagging what you want. You'll be served with divorce papers on Wednesday. Her reaction was unexpected. She almost seemed relieved. I'm very sorry, Julian. I shouldn't have gone behind your back. You deserve the truth, she said quietly. Sorry you cheated or sorry you got caught. I asked bitterly. I'm sorry I didn't tell you I was unhappy. I'm sorry I was too scared to ask for a divorce a couple of months ago when I decided I wanted out. You deserve so much more from me, she said, her eyes filling with tears. You've been seeing him for a couple of months, I said, my voice rising with anger and hurt. No, we've only been together a few times over the past couple of weeks, she sighed. But I've wanted out of the marriage for the last six months. What? Why? I asked feeling like my world had shifted. Because I'm 25 years old, and I don't want to have to come home by 10 o'clock if I'm having fun with my friends. 
I don't want to worry about offending your boss at a party if I drink too much. If I see something I want but can't afford, I want to be able to buy it without feeling like I'm taking money away from our future children, she responded, her voice tinged with frustration. So you decided to stop being an adult and return to your carefree early twenties, I said. Well, you've got it. I took half of our savings and I'm removing my name from the lease tomorrow. I took an extra $75 for an STD test. We were intimate last Sunday, and I'm sure you've been with him before that. I can't trust you to care enough to use protection. You want your freedom. Enjoy it. Have fun with your new friends and your new job. As much as I tried to stay calm, I couldn't help but raise my voice. Yes, when we got married, I was barely able to drink legally. There's a lot of life out there that we both missed. At the time, I thought I was okay with it. Now, I'm not so sure. Going out with Jeremy and his friends reminded me of the fun we used to have. Just hanging out and being a little young and foolish. What part of missing out on life involves cheating on me? What part of it makes it okay to be with someone else while still married? I thought that, if nothing else, we were friends. Friends don't betray each other like that. You really are a piece of work. I thought my mom and sister were bad examples, but apparently, all women are the same. I had to stop shouting when I mentioned my mom and sister. My mom's infidelity had driven my father to alcoholism, and two years after he left, I found him dead from alcohol poisoning when I went to visit him. My mom was only angry that the child support checks had stopped coming. She spent what little money was left on cosmetic surgery and put my sister Adrienne on birth control, encouraging her to get pregnant by a wealthy man. Adrienne managed to seduce Tony Winger, the son of a local businessman, but when Tony found out he wasn't the father after a DNA test, he left her. Adrienne went to a back alley clinic and caught a blood infection, leading to septic shock and her death at home. My mom tried to sue, but the legal fees were too high, so she dropped the case. The following year was a nightmare as I tried to finish school and deal with the men my mom brought home. College dorms seemed like a lifeline. A month into college, I received news from the police that my mother had died in a car accident. She and her boss had been having an affair and were killed in a collision with a garbage truck caused by his impaired driving. I managed to get most of my money back from college for the semester and had to handle everything. Despite the chaos, we owned a house and my mom had a car and a 401 with nearly $100,000 in it. There was also a savings account with $4,300 and a stash of DVDs in cash. The DVDs were labeled retirement. Despite my better judgment, I decided to watch one and discovered it contained recordings of my mom with other men. I also found nearly $9,000 in cash. I wasn't surprised. I spent the following month cleaning up and dealing with paperwork and had a few people come by to pay their respects. I didn't watch the rest of the videos but assumed that some of the men on the tapes were among those who had visited. I sold the house, deposited the money into the bank, and returned to school for the winter semester. I lived frugally and focused solely on my studies. I had occasional calls from women interested in casual encounters, which I was willing to entertain. However, I was not impressed with relationships and found that getting too close was more trouble than it was worth. I graduated in the top 25 of my class and secured a managerial position with a growing construction company. Socializing with colleagues at bars led to meeting new people, including women. I thought I might have found someone decent when I met Gwen on a blind date. Although I was a few years older, she seemed great, recently graduated with an accounting degree, and had a promising job with the state police and forensics. However, my experience with Gwen proved to be disappointing. She began to tear up as she spoke, which only fueled my frustration. She wanted out of the marriage, betrayed me, and now felt remorseful. I felt a deep sense of betrayal and anger. I told her she would be served with divorce papers on Wednesday at noon at work. I had marked the items I wanted to take from the apartment, and they would be removed the next day. She could keep her car, and I would keep mine. 
my name would be removed from the lease at the end of the month. I've taken half of our savings, I said. I want the credit card paid off and cancelled. I don't plan on this getting nasty, mainly because I don't want to see you again. However, if you or your new partner cross my path, I will handle it as needed, not out of vengeance but to ensure respect. Her reaction to my tone was noticeable, but I didn't let it deter me. I gathered my packed bags and brushed past her. I planned to collect the items marked with tape the next day while she was at work. If she wanted to contest it, she could remove the tape, and I would list those items in the divorce documents for the judge to decide. She didn't contest the divorce. When my mom passed away, I placed all the money from her estate into a trust. My accountant had advised me that as long as the trust held my money, it wouldn't count towards my net worth for student aid. However, I later found out that it did count against financial aid due to the way the trust was set up. The accountant's advice proved faulty, and I ended up with about $13,000 in student debt. Thankfully, my company had a program that covered $5,000 per year towards student loans, which helped. The trust did shield me from the divorce, as I hadn't named Gwen as a trustee, leaving about $600,000 out of her reach. I moved out of the apartment and found a small furnished loft near work, leaving the remainder of the situation to my lawyer. To simplify the process, I cut Gwen a check for $15,000 and walked away. It became clear why Gwen didn't ask for support after the dust settled. She was pregnant and planning a summer wedding. All her complaints about not wanting to be tied down seemed to have been a prelude to her next phase. I threw myself into my job and was rewarded with a new position as Improvement Assessment Coordinator for the company. My role involved traveling across the country to make newly acquired companies more efficient. My nickname, The Mash Eat Man, came from my reputation for cutting the dead weight. I'd give them one chance to get it in gear, and if they didn't, they were gone. Generally, employees who had been there less than 10 years were more willing to make the changes needed to keep their jobs. I avoided targeting the more senior employees, but I ended up with a reputation for cutting senior staff. I was considered a pariah by both management and hourly staff, and I didn't care. I wasn't there to make friends. I was there to make the company money. The bills weren't going to get paid by rainbows and butterflies. As for my love life, the first year after my divorce, I was turned off by women. I hadn't found a single woman who was worth my time, so why bother trying to wine and dine them? The second year, I felt the need to be intimate. I had a lot of money and was traveling quite a bit, so I figured I would support the world's oldest profession. There's a quote that says you don't pay a sex worker for intimacy, you pay her to leave. That summed up my life perfectly. I would cruise into town, handle my business, and on the last day, either pick up a high-end escort or use a discreet service. The encounters were usually top-notch, and we both knew where the other stood. I should have been doing this all along, forget relationships. I had no clue what my ex-wife was up to, nor did I really care. I suppose I should mention that I went to counseling and worked through my issues with Gwen and women in general. No, I didn't. I think counseling is great for those who can benefit from it. But I really had no desire to change. I was enjoying a variety of no-strings-attached encounters keeping most of my paycheck, and had found a passion for restoring old motorcycles. I had moved an hour away and bought a nice big house on the outskirts of a small town. It had a huge pole building with an old 1969 Triumph Bonneville. I had stipulated that the garage be cleaned out before closing, but the old owner was too busy. According to the purchase agreement, I owned everything in the pole building at the time of possession. The old bike was partially disassembled, but I fell in love with its lines. I've always been good with my hands, so I bought an expensive set of Mac tools and went to work. I had the bike 75% restored when the owner tried to reclaim it from me. We went around and around, but the fact was he gave it up by not removing it, so it was mine. I gave him $500 to sign the title over to me. It was easier than fighting it out in court. After that, I found a 1963 BZ Gold Star Spitfire 
that needed some work. I was hooked. I wasn't a professional, but I was improving. I was supposed to sell a bike and then buy a new project, but that didn't happen. I ended up with a nice collection of restored vintage motorcycles. So here I was, divorced for seven years, with plenty of money in the bank, a job I was good at, a rewarding hobby, and all the companionship I could afford. I was pretty content until I came home with a new throttle cable for my latest purchase and saw an old, beat-up Toyota sedan in my driveway. As I pulled around it, I saw a woman get out of the car. I got out and was face to face with my ex-wife, Jules. If there was any way to avoid it, you would have never seen me again. I wronged you, and while I feel terrible about it, I can't go back and change it. As much as I would like to, this isn't about me, it's for our daughter. She handed me a photo of a cute little girl with a big smile missing a couple of baby teeth. The photo looked like it was taken at a mall or something. She was adorable. A real cutie. It's a shame her mom is such a person. Now, what are you trying to pull with saying she is mine? With how you were behaving towards the end of our marriage, it could be anybody. I heard the Fifth Fleet was in town around that time. Jules sighed. Julian, take all the shots you want. I know I screwed up royally. I was a real mistake and deserve anything you want to say to me. But our daughter has leukemia and needs a bone marrow donor. I'm not being overly dramatic when I say she will die without it. Every other option has been exhausted. She's on a donor list, but it could take years, and she only has months. As for how I know she's yours, Jeremy is sterile, and you were the only person I had close to her other than him. Go ahead and hate me. Most of the time, I hate myself. If you want to drag me inside and take a few swings at me, go for it. But please, please, please get yourself tested to see if you match. She was crying by this point. So you want me to go through an invasive procedure to help a daughter who may or may not be mine and who has been raised by another man, a man who was there for her first steps, her first words, her first lost tooth. Moments I missed because you couldn't figure out whose fire hose was in your possession at what time. Have you told her about me? Would this little girl even be able to pick me out of a lineup, even if I was the sperm donor? You can't call me her father. That title belongs to the man who was there for her. By the way, where's the little one? I figured you two must be in love, given how quickly you got married after stabbing me in the back. I noticed she got a sad look on her face. Jeremy left us when he found out he wasn't her biological father, she said. His parents pushed him into a test, and it came back with no markers in common. It turns out he is sterile, and probably has been all his life. I don't miss him one bit, but it tears my heart out and pisses me off that he just left Laura sitting in a hospital bed crying and has never returned. You're right. He is the only father she has known. It hurt her deeply to be abandoned like that. So there is a measure of revenge for you. I'm a divorced single mother living on welfare and trying to help a chronically ill child, she continued. Look, my life has gone to hell the last two years. Believe me when I say that any revenge you could wish upon me has come full circle. The only good thing that has happened to me since we broke up is Laura. If you want to know any more, you'll have to make an appointment to get tested. Here is the contact information along with a couple of other pictures of Laura. Please, just get tested. She sobbed as she turned and ran back to her car, her departure delayed by a few attempts to get the engine to start. As she pulled away, I saw drops of oil on my driveway. While I got the cat litter to soak it up, I thought long and hard about her request. I'm in a hole, and I'm not ashamed to admit it, but I'm not the type to let a kid possibly die if I can help it. Even if it turns out she wasn't mine, my seven-year-old should be in her position. I was surprised by how quickly I decided to get tested. I made the call and found out she was my biological child. The test also showed that I was a close enough match to risk the bone marrow procedure. I scheduled everything without telling Gwen. I used to run background checks on people, so I did one on Gwen. It turned out everything she had told me seemed to be true. Jeremy had left her high and dry, even going so far as to get the marriage annulled. 
For the past two years, Gwen had been scraping by on assistance and waitressing jobs. Most of her time was spent in hospitals. The medical costs were extensive even with Medicaid. Things were pretty grim for both her and Laura. I decided to sell my bike collection to free up the cash needed for the medical bills and back child support. It was funny. I had rebuffed all offers to sell my bikes, but when I found out I had a daughter, the decision was simple. I went to the HR manager and surprised her by taking four weeks off and asking to add my daughter to my insurance policy. I could tell she wanted the whole story, but she was one of those who would tell everyone in the world about everything that happened in her office, so I kept things quiet. I showed up at the hospital with a stack of papers for Gwen to sign and the biggest teddy bear I could find. My heart nearly broke when I saw the little figure with no hair and a bunch of tubes running in and out of her body. I had to choke back tears when she opened her eyes and smiled at me. I felt my entire world shift. At that point, I knew I would protect this little girl from anything or anyone who wanted to harm her. I ignored Gwen as she tried to hug me and went up to the hospital bed. Hey, was all I could manage. Hello, I'm Laura. Mom tells me you are my real daddy. I replied, yeah, it turns out I might be able to help you get better. I brought you a beer. Her eyes lit up as she reached out for it. Her smile grew even bigger as she took it from me and gave it a great big hug. Thank you so much. What's his name? She asked. It's a stuffed animal. Why does it need a name? I replied. Well, they said you would know what it is when you picked him up. It's Charlie, she said definitively. Hello, Charlie. Thank you for coming to keep me company, she said to the bear. Thank you for bringing Charlie to me, Julian, she said to me. I was on the verge of losing it. If I were in her position, I would have been howling in anger and despair. Instead, she was thankful for a simple stuffed toy. I turned my head and saw Gwen watching with a look of fierce pride for her daughter. My estimation of Gwen as a mother went up significantly. To keep it together like she had and still raised this little angel was amazing. She was still a lousy wife, but her strength as a mother was undeniable. Laura had drifted back to sleep, holding onto that teddy bear as tightly as she could. This transplant had better work. I knew if it was in my power to make anything happen, I would. I nodded to Gwen, and we went down to the cafeteria for a cup of coffee. I slid the papers to her. Here is the paperwork to get her added to my insurance. I'll have a $1,500 deductible, and then everything is paid for. Thankfully, they haven't rescinded the existing conditions rider to the healthcare system yet, so she will be okay. I also had them start sending me the bills for her health care. I should be able to get everything paid off within a couple of months. I didn't mention to Gwen that I had $50,000 for my bike sales sitting around. It was amazing to see the tension drain from her body. For a brief moment, she looked like the woman I remembered. I hadn't realized how much weight she was carrying. Thank you, Julian, for everything. I know you have every right to hate me but thank you for doing this for her, she said, her eyes full of tears. It's what I would have done if I had known, I replied. Gwen, I had our company do a background check on you. By all accounts, you've been an outstanding mother. I will be punishing Jeremy soon enough for neglecting my daughter, but don't think that I've forgotten how you decided to throw away our marriage for a little bit of fun. Don't think I won't hold you responsible for missing her first words, her first steps, or her first bike ride. You might be a great mother, but you were a really lousy wife. Her head dropped, and I could hear the sniffles. Years ago, those would have broken my heart, but now they had no effect on me. I slid another packet of papers across to her. This is a preliminary custody agreement, I said, causing her head to snap up. I'm not going to take her away from you, but I want to be part of her life. I'm proposing getting her every weekend and one month during the summer with alternating holidays. Pretty standard stuff. Look it over and we can discuss any changes. I'll need copies of her birth certificate and other documents. Do you happen to have them on you? She looked at me, seeming to search my face for something but didn't find it. Then she cast her eyes down. I will have to get them for you. 
My car died, so I took the bus here this morning. I'll bring them with me tomorrow, she said softly. My stomach rumbled. It was time for lunch, and I needed those documents soon. Let's go get something to eat that isn't hospital food while she's sleeping, and we can pick up what we need afterward, I suggested. She nodded and wiped her eyes. Great, I'm going to spend my lunch with a crying woman. How did I get myself into this mess? Lunch was interesting, to say the least. For twenty minutes, we sat looking at each other, the silence only broken by us telling the waitress our order. For so long, I had wanted to rip into this woman. My mind pulled out every nasty thing I could think of to throw at her, but I couldn't do it. I took a deep breath and realized that I was going to have to deal with this woman for the foreseeable future. I also recognized that outside of her relationship with her daughter, she had nothing. She made her choices and was living with the consequences. My sense of justice, as warped as it may be, was satisfied. I still didn't trust her or particularly like her, but I wasn't going to hate her anymore. I'm not going to hit you, I said as the thought popped into my head. She flinched and gave me a funny look. When you first approached me, you said I could take a few swings at you. I'm not going to do that. In fact, I'm going to try very hard to drop my animosity and anger toward you. We have a daughter, and I'm not going to poison her life like my parents poisoned mine. You'll probably never be my favorite person, but I'd rather let go of my anger and make sure that our daughter has a loving and stable home. Some of the tension eased out of her. I know you wouldn't hit me, Julian, although I feel I deserve it. I just want you to know. Stop, I said, a bit too loudly. I don't want to hear your apology. Nothing you can say will make what you did and how you did it okay. The basic truth is that you didn't want to be married to me, and you wanted to act like you were single. You could have told me you wanted a divorce. But instead, you went behind my back and had an affair. Then you came home and acted like nothing was wrong. It wasn't a mistake. It was a calculated action. You are not the victim, and you will receive no sympathy from me for how your life turned out. If we didn't have a daughter together, I would never have wanted to see you again. But we do have a child, and I'm going to make sure she has the best life I can give her. That includes having both a mother and a father, so let's eat and talk about how we're going to make that little girl's life better. She looked down at her burger and then back up at me. For the next twenty minutes, we had a great conversation about Laura and how we were going to tackle her cancer. It was actually relatively pleasant. The area where they lived was rough, to say the least. I knew they lived in government-assisted housing, but I didn't realize how bad things were in that part of town. I parked my truck and let Gwen hop out to get the stuff. There were three guys hanging by the entrance to her apartment building, all with their pants down around their knees. I was staying by my truck in this rough neighborhood. Gwen was gone for about fifteen minutes when she came out and walked past a group of men hanging around the entrance. I saw one of them approach her. Hey, Chana, you're too pretty to be living alone around here. You need a man to take care of you, don't you? The man said, moving into her space. My heart raced as I pulled my gun from its waistband holster. My 357 had been replaced by a Glock 19. I know a lot of people feel that a 40 calories is the superior cartridge, but I do a lot of shooting and 9mm rounds are cheaper. Let's face it, I was never planning to get into a gunfight. At least, that was what I thought until a few minutes ago. Now I wasn't so sure. She already has a man looking out for her, so why don't you move out of the way before I drop you all like a bad habit? My voice might have been shaky, but my gun stayed steady on the leader. The kid turned around, and Gwen made a break for the truck. He reached for his waistband, but thought better of it when he saw I had him dead to rights. The two behind him looked scared, but the leader just stared at me with cold eyes. If you reach for that piece, I'll put you down, and it will just be a scared man defending his friend against all the people coming up here and taking our jobs. They'll probably give me a medal for shooting you three. So let's just calm down and let me and the wife get to the truck and get out of here. Then you can go back to whatever it is you want to do, I said as I started moving backward, 
holding the gun steady on the leader. I managed to get back in and seated, all the while keeping him in place with my gun. I turned on the key, shifted into drive, and broke eye contact. I gunned it, hearing three loud pops before I managed to turn a corner and get going. I ran the next two lights and got on the freeway as fast as I could. After about fifteen minutes, I figured no one was following me and slowed down. My heart was still racing. Gwen was sobbing in the passenger seat next to me. You are not bringing my daughter back to that hole. I growled. What do you have in that apartment that you need to get? I asked. Just our clothes and some dishes and stuff, she replied, regaining control of her emotions. A lot of our stuff is still in storage, but I'm probably going to lose that in the next month. I'll buy you new clothes and get Laura new toys, I said. We'll get your stuff out of storage and you'll move into my place for now. I have a four-bedroom house with two bathrooms. You'll take one, Laura will take the other. You'll be handling the cooking and cleaning until you can find a job and get back on your feet. You won't bring any boyfriends to the house, and I won't bring any girlfriends. I'm gone about once a month checking on various plants and whatnot. My house is not going to be your personal retreat. Get a room or stay at his place. I'm dead serious about this. If I find out you're bringing guys over to the house, I'll toss you out and go for full custody of Laura. She looked at me and then at the floor. I'm not seeing anyone, Julian. I haven't had the time or desire for the past three years. I don't see that changing any time soon, so don't worry about that. And thank you. I know you want me around like you want a hole in the head, but it will be nice to have a safe place to go. You should thank Carlos. I responded. Carlos was my best friend growing up. We made an odd pair, me being a lower at white trash nobody, and him being an adopted Hispanic rich kid with two elderly white parents. We did everything together until he got sick when he was 16. I visited him in the hospital every chance I could and watched him waste away as cancer ate him from the inside out. He died two days before his 18th birthday. Mr. and Mrs. Jackson would pass on three years later. There wasn't a day that went by where I didn't envy my friend for the love and support he had from his two parents. I wanted to give my daughter that. It was too late for me to become a normal, well-adjusted adult, but if I could give that feeling of love and support to my daughter, then I could put up with living with my ex-wife for a while. We got her stuff out of storage and had her set up in the spare bedroom within the next couple of days. I might have gone a little overboard decorating Laura's room, but hey, she was my only daughter. Within the next few days, I prepared myself for the procedure. I don't like hospitals, and I'm sure the nurses assigned to me deliberately used the most blunt needles they could find. But I made it through. All told, it took a week. Little Laura rallied for a month, but then it was discovered that the procedure didn't take, so I was out for another week as they tried again. It didn't take, though there was enough positive response that the doctors were willing to try a third time. Finally, it took. Four months after the last treatment, I welcomed Laura to her new home. This is where I tell the story of how Gwen and I fell back in love. No, that didn't happen. I know it probably sounds strange, but I thought of Gwen as two separate people. There was the mother, the Gwen who was warm, loving, supportive, and patient. She took care not only of Laura, but also of me. Laura had missed so much school that we decided to homeschool her for a while to get her back on track. Gwen excelled at that, teaching Laura while still keeping the house clean and dinner on the table. Then there was Gwen the wife, the one who had caused me so much pain. This was the Gwen who cheated on me and hid the fact that I had a daughter. Every time I started to think that maybe Gwen was okay, the anger would return. It was frustrating because I could see that Gwen felt remorseful about how things had turned out, but I was in no mood to hear anything that even hinted at an apology. After using all my sick time, I returned to work. My first day back was exhausting as I missed my daughter so much. Walking out the door each day filled me with anger and jealousy that Gwen got to spend time with our daughter while I had to go to work. I channeled that anger into my work, becoming particularly ruthless and cutting expenses at my next project. 
My boss would have been satisfied with a 7-12% to reduction in expenses, but I managed to push it to a projected 16% by cutting employee benefits and laying off some senior employees. I didn't just cut hourly staff. I also eliminated three managers. I could tell the plant manager was relieved to see me leave. I didn't fly out until the next day, so I stayed at a two-star airport hotel and hung out at the bar downstairs. I never stayed in fancy places while traveling. It seemed out of place for someone who was cutting costs and firing people. As I drank my overpriced, watered-down glass of scotch, I noticed an attractive brunette walk in. I knew the drill. She was likely trying to salvage her night after a few failed attempts elsewhere. Thankfully, I was willing and able to pay her price for the night. We engaged in small talk and danced around the topic of pricing before heading up to my room. I left my wallet and valuables with the front desk clerk. The room had a safe, but I was aware that she could still have a weapon and forced me to open it. She was professional enough to text her time and location to someone, whether it was a friend or a manager. Once we were in the room, I set $400 on the nightstand. She gave me a puzzled look as our conversation had circled around the number $300. It's been almost six months, so I'd hope you'd be willing to spend a little extra time with me tonight, I said with a grin. She slid her dress down, revealing a black lace bra and panty set. She was skilled in her profession, quiet, efficient, and good at what she did. It took about 20 minutes, but eventually... I felt my body tighten as I reached climax. Afterward, she slid out from under me, dressed, checked her makeup in the mirror, and took the money from the nightstand before wishing me well. I dealt with the aftermath and hit the sack, sleeping deeply. The following morning, as I sat in my cramped coach seat, I reflected on the previous night. It was good, no doubt, and she was among the better ones I'd had. But something felt off. I decided not to dwell on it too much. As the plane touched down, my thoughts turned to what I could get for Laura. My little girl had adjusted well, and she was set to start second grade in the fall. I made sure Gwen had enough money to buy her any clothes or toys she needed. Was she too young for one of those new tablets you could draw on? What about a cell phone? She was going to be nine years old. Did nine-year-olds need cell phones? I would have to ask some friends. Who was I kidding? I had no friends. My assistant had kids. Maybe she would know. I picked out a stuffed frog from the airport gift shop for my daughter. I was enjoying this new dad role. When I arrived home, the smell of dinner cooking was divine. But even better was the squeal and big hug I received from my daughter. She was wearing a new dress with a ribbon in her hair. Mom bought me a new dress so I could look pretty for you when you got home. She also said I have enough hair to get a new haircut. Do you like it, Daddy? She asked. I couldn't help but feel a surge of emotion, my eyes tearing up. You are absolutely beautiful, honey. That dress is really pretty, and your new haircut makes you look like a princess, I said, giving her a big hug and a kiss. I have something for you, I continued, pulling out the frog from the store bag. The woman at the counter said this guy needed a name and I knew you'd have the perfect one for him. Laura's face lit up with delight as she looked at the frog. It's Randy, she said. Hi, Randy. I'm going to introduce you to Charlie the Bear. You two are going to be great friends. She then headed to her room, but turned around to give me another big hug. Thanks, Dad. I looked over at Gwen, who also had tears in her eyes. I felt a pang of regret, realizing that Gwen had kept this joy for me for the past eight years. I pushed that thought away. My mother's bitterness was not going to taint my relationship with Laura. I forced a smile. Dinner smells good, I said, trying to sound normal. Thanks, Julian. I found my old batch of recipes and tried to make the chicken parmesan just how you like it, Gwen replied. Her effort to create a normal home life for Laura was evident. I'm sure it will be great. I responded with genuine enthusiasm. It was nice to have my clothes taken care of and the house cleaned. Laura and Gwen had been with me for about three months now. If I had to put up with Gwen, I would. 
I didn't want her to leave because I knew she would take Laura with her. I had considered seeking primary custody, but my lawyer warned that with my work schedule and lack of parenting experience, it would be a long and challenging fight. Besides, a girl needs her mother. About a year after they moved in, Laura was back in regular school. Gwen had done an excellent job teaching her not only the necessary academic skills, but also how to study and focus. Laura was on the honor roll, and I felt like I was thriving. I was getting my needs met once or twice a month during my business trips. The house was clean, and my clothes were well cared for. My little girl was the center of my world, and Gwen and I had settled into a comfortable routine. Gwen surprised me by asking if she could use the car to look for a job. I had bought a used Subaru wagon for her to use for errands and to transport Laura. It was in good condition and had a great safety rating. As far as I'm concerned, that car is yours, I said. I'll never use it. If you move out, it's old enough that the resale value will be minimal. Why don't I just put the title in your name? If something happens to me, everything goes to Laura. It will be held in trust until she turns 18. You should have a car to help her out until she's able to get around by herself. I saw tears start to form in Gwen's eyes. Thank you, Julian. You've been so good to us, and I'm not sure why. You must know by now that I wouldn't stop you from seeing Laura, even if I could, and child support wouldn't be much more than what you're paying for us to be here. Why are you being so nice to us, or rather to me? I thought carefully about how to answer. This was also the first time I realized I wasn't angry at her anymore. Before, I had been holding back my anger for Laura's sake, but now... I truly had no resentment. I took a deep breath and gathered my thoughts. My mother's bitterness had poisoned me and my sister, and I didn't want to pass that on to Laura. I wanted to move forward without the bitterness. Make no mistake, I began, if Laura hadn't come into my life, I would probably have hated you until the day I died. But it's different now. The short answer to your question is that Laura likes you, so I like you. I think we can move forward being friendly if not friends. The tears began flowing freely, and Gwen walked over to hug me. My allergies acted up, and my eyes watered as well. It felt good to let go of the anger and hurt. Don't get me wrong, there was still some resentment, but it wasn't at the forefront anymore. Laura came down to the kitchen, saw us hugging and crying, and decided she needed to join in. The three of us embraced for a long time. My heart swelled with pride as I watched Laura cross the stage to receive her diploma. Quint was sitting next to me, holding my hand with tears in her eyes. Laura had been accepted into Harvard and would be leaving us in a couple of months. It was all she could talk about. Thankfully, she had received some scholarships, so her education fund would cover the rest. I didn't want to tell her she couldn't attend her school of choice, but I wasn't sure I could afford full tuition for an Ivy League school. As for Gwen, she had found a job and moved out about six months after we had our discussion. We sat down, and she explained what had driven her to leave. It was a combination of being away from friends and family, along with the influence of some new acquaintances that made her yearn for her carefree days. She got involved with someone who was not a good fit for her, which led to a series of choices she later regretted. She confided that she had married him primarily because she was pregnant and scared of being a single mom, and that his decision to marry her had been heavily influenced by his parents. She claimed that she hadn't realized Laura wasn't his until the paternity test, though I suspect she might be in denial about that. However, I didn't want to dwell on it. Sometimes, karma delivers unexpected outcomes. Our company acquired his company, and guess who was sent to evaluate productivity? It gets even better. His father, who had worked at the company for 19 years and had gotten his son a job there, was also affected. Both father and son, along with 10 other employees, were laid off. It took about a month for them to make the connection, and then we received various threatening calls and emails. My decisions had been justified by my past performance and reviews. They sued our company, but we managed to drag it out until their lawyer lost interest. 
They shouldn't have treated my daughter poorly, and his father shouldn't have called her a mistake. Speaking of mistakes, I might have made a significant one last night. Gwen, feeling sad about Laura leaving, came over to talk. We had become good friends and supported each other. She had been dating but recently discovered that her new partner was married. I helped her by returning his belongings to his home, which led to an unexpected conversation. One thing led to another, and we ended up spending the night together. It started with a brief encounter, but I invited her to stay the night, and we ended up being close for a couple of hours before going to sleep. Now, I'm left with many questions and uncertainties. Today, however, is about focusing on Laura. Tomorrow will be another day to reflect on what happened. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.